meaning that some in the first earth age proved themselves to the point that our Father will use them. He will send them. So he touches and gives sight, a spiritual sight, a deeper sight, an understanding. And how blessed it is to be able to have the word come to life for you and to understand. And unfortunately, or fortunately in my book, the poor old boy that he healed, they threw him out of the church. They excommunicated him because he wouldn't denounce Christ. And of course, I think it's the best thing that ever happened to him myself that they excommunicated him because now uh, he at least believes. Well, as we rejoin that particular incident, after he was excommunicated, Christ will walk up and begin to talk to him. I don't think Christ insisted that he lose any sleep from being thrown out of the church. So, the ninth chapter of St. John, the 35th verse, let's put, join them there, and let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father in Yahshua's name. And verse 35 reads in that ninth chapter, Jesus heard that they had cast him out, excommunicated him, and when he had found him, which means that Christ actually sought him out, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Now, it's important. I mean, this is that living water, the light that he had taught earlier in this chapter. That if you, he believed upon him. And I think it's probably good that you question yourself, then what is important about salvation? It's obvious that this particular church did not do it for him, and I'm not knocking churches now. But however, he wasn't able to have the presence of the living Christ in his life with the healing and still fit in this church. They threw him out. So uh, I think it's important now that Christ will tell him what is really required to overcome. So he asked him that simple question, are you a believer? Do you believe that I am the Son of God? That, uh, Christ being the Son of God, being the Messiah, of course. Verse 36, he answered and said, who is he, Lord? that I might believe on him, question. This shows that the man had faith in Christ. I mean, after all, he had given him sight. And whoever he said he was, he was gonna follow that one because he knew this man uh, shot straight from the hip. Verse 37, and Jesus said unto him, thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. In other words, I, I'm, I am that one. Verse 38, and he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. You see, that's, that's what's necessary, that you believe, and it's that simple, that you believe that Yahshua, which is to say Yahweh's Savior, the Son of God, was sent by God, and that you, by you believing, that he is the Son of God, being Emmanuel, God with us, that it changes your life. And not only changes your life here, but will change your life eternally, giving you eternal life, and also causing the blessings of God to fall into your life, and wherever you are, in as much as that spirit is in you, then you're a blessing really to your family if you do it right. I mean, we all mess up at times and certainly none of us are perfect. But you're going to make your family and other people feel better because you have that foundation and you don't have to tell them why. They will know that you do make a difference, that when you walk into the room, that spirit also goes into that room and they can feel it. Don't ever think they can't. And I, I would say this, a person that, my, that must tell someone that he brings the Spirit with him probably doesn't have it. The Spirit witnesses for itself, all right? But uh, actually, I suppose what Christ was telling him here, it's all right to be excommunicated from that group because um, <clears throat> you're talking to him 
And naturally, when you consider the office and all things that it constitutes, which is the giving of eternal life, uh, he was studying, he had no problems anyway, especially when he worshiped him, meaning the fact that he did worship, meaning understanding. Verse 39, and Jesus said, for judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And those that, this is a kind of, and this is said, I don't want to say that it's said in irony, but many that claim they can see, let's take like the church doctors here that threw him out, they claim they can see to the public. I mean, after all, that's the head guru of the establishment had the authority to say, you are excommunicated, uh, boy. Well, then again, being the best thing that ever happened to him to get away from a bunch of self-righteous hypocrites, but actually they were the blind ones. And he was that was absolutely blind, born blind, and never before had one gained his sight that had been born blind. There had naturally been occasions where someone lost their sight for some reason, perhaps the way they were eating, maybe, and on straightening that out, regained sight. But never one that was born blind and then was given sight. And what Christ is talking about here, in as much as he is the light, and while he is with us, and he always is, then if you believe, then you can see the light, for the light is truth. You can actually see the light, he being that light, for it is the word, he being that living word. So many that could not see uh, through the spiritual eye, he gives that sight to, perhaps he has you. And sometimes it's necessary in practice, if you must, to close your flesh eyes and meditate and begin to see with your spiritual eye. Do you understand? Verse 40. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? I mean, they, they knew what he was talking about. 41. And Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, you would have no sin. But and now ye say, We see. Therefore, your sin remaineth. I suppose we could say from this that a sin committed in ignorance where one doesn't see or know better, it's no sin. But if you claim to be a scripture lawyer, claim to know the word, then you yourself make yourself responsible and guilty of breaking the word. Now, God, knowing that we, inasmuch as we're under grace, that we all fall short on repentance, we're forgiven for that, so we see anyway. That's, that's what grace is, and that's what's so wonderful about our Father, that he paid the price, gave his life for us, that we might see that beautiful truth that is entailed in the very actions and life he set forth on this earth for all of us to see. I don't know, can you see? Doesn't mean you're perfect, but if you were to claim to be perfect, you would kind of be like those self-righteous hypocrites that uh, excommunicated him out of the church. But knowing reality, and that we do fall short, and the beautiful gift, and it is a gift of grace for believing, that he paid that price for us. Okay, enough said, chapter 10, verse 1, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he kind of continues the subject, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Now, um, it is so easy for one that is familiar with the way of life at the time of this writing, or uh, that lives perhaps an agricultural life, or rural, have been uh, reared in a rural setting, it's so much easier to understand. You see, there was a sheep cot, which is simply a shed, or a pen, 
or a lot with sometimes say like a half shelter that the sheep were driven into each night by the shepherd not necessarily driven but were placed within and um, and they were kept there the porter kept the sheep at night so the shepherd could sleep uh, you will find these in sheep country you will find Occasionally, you'll see an old rock wall when you're out in the field, and you might wonder, well, I wonder if this was, you know, some ancient building or something, and no, it was a sheep cot. They're still made by stones being, you know, a stone fence being built and so forth. But you see, you will find out that there are many predators for sheep, or against sheep, because a lamb is probably the mo one of the most helpless things, uh, aside from an, a, a human infant, than probably any other creature. And perhaps that's why that God would use them as an example of ourselves. Verse 2, <clears throat> But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Verse 3, to him the porter openeth, that's the doorkeeper, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. Now, it's important that you know, and if you've ever uh, had the opportunity to see a real shepherd with a, his small herd working, you would understand this. He talks to them. And they know his voice. A stranger can walk up and begin talking to them and they'll pull away. They don't know that voice. They literally have that one-on-one -on -one, uh, um, relationship with that shepherd. But I hope you noted, it did not say that he drove them. It says he knows them by name. That means individually and that he calls them. He doesn't drive anybody anywhere. He's not gonna drive you. That is to say the Messiah won't. Hey, he did his part, the rest of it's up to you. If you wanna be a loser, hey, have at it. You see, that's really, we're getting right down here to the core of what this life is all about. It's for you to make your own mind up what you choose to believe and do with your soul, yourself, perhaps better said, for the eternity. Thus, you have absolutely no complaint to the Father or anyone else if he must sentence you to a course or a way that's into a lake that uh, things are a little hot. But it's, it's your choice. That's basically what this, thus, there, uh, therefore, rather, Christ will never drive anyone anywhere. Now, it is true that as far as election are concerned, or you might say even shepherding is concerned, he will interfere in their lives. But you know why, because the elect were chosen even before the foundation of this earth. But I hope that you can see the personal relationship. He knows your name. He knows how to call you by name. And he leads you, and you might say, well, he's never led me. Oh, no. Oh, yes, he has. He has shown you the path and the course that if you want good things, put, choose this course. By wanting good things, that means receiving the blessings of God. If you receive the blessings of God, almost everything you touch, you prosper by it. It seems like that, um, let's see, there's an old saying in Japan, you could fall in the honey pot and come out smelling like a rose. Well, I think I can say that, and you'll all get the point. And, but it's really true. With God's blessings, you just really can't hardly go wrong, all right? He leads he set the course uh, long ago. It's up to you as to whether you want to follow. Verse 4. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep 
follow him, for they know his voice. In other words, when he puts you forth or asks you to do a thing, he's already been there before you. There has not been one common temptation to man that he didn't experience and overcome. We experience it, and sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't. But by following him and by knowing his voice, then uh, certainly, again, I, I want to emphasize the word follow, not drive. So many people feel that uh, in certain churches, and if you happen to be in one, I think I should probably mention it, you must do this or you are out. You must do that. You must do this. That's bondage, my friend. Christ doesn't operate that way. He shows you the way and these so-called preachers must do, you must do preachers, are simply um, driving the sheep because you see, whatever you do, if you break one of the things, you're going to pay the price anyway. I don't care what, what, what way it is of nature. I'll, I'll use the drunkard. If the drunkard goes real straight for quite some time and then messes up, it's party time, and here he goes, and the next morning, it's work time. Oh, mercy. Now, that's what they tell me. I don't know. I'm, I have very little experience along those lines, but I, I, being an old Marine, I have been there. I know what it feels like. So you're going to pay when you don't follow um, everything in moderation. You know, and following his course is a lot more to have blessings than to have cursings, all right? Follow him. Well, how do I do that? He gave you the whole map right here. You see, he created these bodies. He knows what makes them tick. And this is the way. If you want to do it right, well, then follow as best you can. Okay, let's take the next verse, if we may, verse 5. And a stranger will they not follow but will flee from him. For they know not the voice of, strain, uh, of uh, strangers. This is a very important, this word know not, a double negative loses the distinction of each, but joined together to make a real, a really strong statement. Um, it's a little peculiar to John, but it means um, oh me, oh, oh de oh me. It means that intuitively, from childbirth, you know, you know his voice when you hear it. Well, does that mean I was Christian born? Well, most likely, in your family. You know intuitively the truth when you hear it. And you know that it is the Word of God. And you recognize it. And as far as following a stranger, the spurious Messiah, and I'm talking to God's Christ's sheep now. If the spurious Messiah is to say something, they're going to know it just that quick, intuitively. They will know, who me, know better. It's just, it is just within. And I think probably if I were to give my opinion, I think that it is when you receive the Holy Spirit within yourself, that is to say you believe upon him and he touches you, that that spirit within witnesses against that that is negative, that is strange, different, and that's the way Satan operates. And it speaks to the inner man giving warning. I mean, I felt it, and when you stop and think, you've felt it. Many times we go ahead and say, oh, well, maybe it's just a feeling, I'll go ahead and do it anyway, and wham! I knew better. Shouldn't have done that, but you did, all right? And again, you pay the price. 
but you follow his voice and not the voice of strangers. Now, um, someone that is not one of his sheep that will follow yay or nay, and sheep don't operate that way. They're, they're smarter than that. People aren't sometimes, but sheep are just not dumb. They know their shepherd, all right? And they, won't, they will not follow a stranger, even with bribery they want. So I think that's good that you catch the innermost feeling that you automatically, I'll put it that way, that you automatically know that it is correct. Verse 6, this parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. They didn't quite understand. Verse 7, then said Jesus unto them again, uh, he, he explains it further, very patiently, verily, verily, that's truly, truly, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. And then you can begin to understand why that if Christ is the door, then through Christ only can you enter into the fold. The fo fold of Almighty God, if you would put it so. That's what the parable means. Only through Him. And somebody that tries to come up some different way other than through him, I'm sorry. There are many methods that men have worked out as far as salvation goes, but they had better all hinge on the door. Verse eight, all that ever come came rather before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. In other words, there were many, and I think you'd better and as much as this was spoken at his first advent, you had better consider this as the second for his second coming, that there would be many before that would come and say, I'm the door, or this is the way to the door, or let me guide you, brother. All right. Always let the word guide you. All right. Don't let, don't be very careful about following man. The word is Christ and he is the door. So why not go to the source? And then you won't be disappointed, you won't be let down, and you'll be a winner, all right? All that come before him, well, if it's the Antichrist, we know the Antichrist is coming first, and what's he after? He's a thief. He wants your soul because he wants company in the lake of fire. He wants to play Messiah, verse 9. I am the door, again for emphasis. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out. Now listen to me. He shall go in and out and find pasture. What, is, what does it mean here, find pasture? Well, that's food. In other words, if you believe upon him, you can not only enter into the sheep cot, you can not only enter into the fold, but you can leave when you want to. You can, in other words, you can walk wherever you want to and you're still saved. You, you don't have to, what, what am I saying? What is he saying, rather? You don't have to be afraid of your salvation. He's able. He's strong. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's good if you can have a good local Bible teaching church that you can go to, but if not, hey, you're okay. Stay in the Word. You can go in and out and find pasture, that's to find blessings, to find the logic that is entailed and recorded within the word itself. What he's promising here is blessings upon you, knowledge. Um, this word pasture is where the word pastor comes from. He that tends a pastor is supposed to provide food for the sheepfold. That is, and in this case, the analogy being God's children. But don't ever, anytime some man tells you, you can't do this and you can't do that and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. He's put you in bondage. You can go in and out. You can go wherever you want to, if you believe. 
And you don't have to worry because you have one with you, a shepherd. And that shepherd, of course, is Christ himself. Don't be afraid. And don't let man put you in bondage. Verse 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal. You want to know what a thief comes for? Let's see our choices here. Steal and to kill and to destroy. As a matter of fact, his name is the destroyer. That's one of Satan's names. And Christ continues, I am. There's the sacred name, the etymology. I am come that they might have life. That's to say eternal life and that they might have it more abundantly. More abundantly means that it's full, that it has the blessings, that it has the food, as well as the freedom, that you can be happy. I mean, after all, you're a child of the king. You're a child of God. Why shouldn't you be happy? If he pours his blessings out upon you, things kind of come easy then for you. And it, it just, I guess another way I could say it, we have an old saying, you kind of got it made, all right? You really do. Because love is instilled within you from he that paid that price, and you know his voice, and you know you are a lamb of that fold. And sure, a lamb is a little bit helpless, all right? But when you have a shepherd that's 10,000 angels just above your head to lamb blast anything that might come against you if it were necessary, using good judgment in all things, it's, not a, it's a lamb that can walk into the, a quadrant of demonic spirits and, hey, they're out of here, friend. They don't want anything to do with that lamb if that lamb is under the protection of God because he will fry demons, all right? Verse, the, the lamb pointing toward them. Touch not mine anointed, he says, all right? So he's a fantastic shepherd to have. So don't ever, don't ever let anyone steal your freedom. Never let anyone kill the spirit of your soul to throw dampened ice water upon you. And never, never let anyone destroy your good works. Always present them in the name of Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And you will have a full life. Do you know what full means? That means everything, the blessings. Verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep. And of course, that would mean that he would be crucified, yes. But he would not die if you know the truth. That he would, in the crucifixion, defeat death and the devil, the thief, the destroyer, and the killer, and the robber. They are defeated. And you should look at it in that way as you stay on guard, of course. Because this giving his life for the sheep, and you're one of them, and he knows your name, then he's able to take, he's able to take care of you when you um, follow him using common sense. Verse 12. Why do I say using common sense? I feel I say that quite often and I don't explain it all that much. There are places that you can be stupid and walk into and get killed. But if you use common sense, you say, hey, I ain't got no business here. And if I ain't got no business here, I'm going to be going somewhere else. Or in using common sense, if it means protecting your own home, you protect it with whatever gauge it takes, all right? And, and sleep good at night, all right? Using common sense, God takes care of the rest. Verse 12, but he that is an hireling, that's somebody that does it for the money, and not the shepherd whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. You know, 
Well, well, what is a harling? Well, every servant, I, I don't want to say, well, that's somebody that preaches for money. Well, everybody's got to live, all right? It, it so happens I don't. Uh, I don't live. No, I don't take a salary. But the Father and I have that all worked out. You don't have to worry about it. It's been working for 40 or 50 years that he blesses me in such a way that I, I don't have to have. But that's not what it's talking about. A hireling is one that goes into pastorship for the purpose of making money and feels a church should make money, all right? And you have these little hirelings that'll come around. I even receive letters in the mail from a rarely, rarely, most no better, most of that type no better. I am an experienced fundraiser. I have raised funds for this church, Joe Blow and what have you, when he was about to go under. I have gimmicks. I really have gimmicks. Well, of course, I would not allow someone like that on church property unless they came to study. But for their business, forget it. They would not get in the door because the true shepherd raises the finances for a real ministry. You don't even have to talk about it or worry about it or think about it or telethon it, you know. But you would be amazed. As a matter of fact, I can in all honesty tell you that many years ago when I first started in television, I almost quit as soon as I started when I began to see and meet other television peoples and all they could talk about is how do you raise your money? This is how I raise mine. Not what saith the Lord God's word, but money, money, money. And uh, it did not take me long to isolate myself from peoples like that or quit. Because if, there, if I were to lose my honesty, then I, it would be the next thing to losing my soul. Because I was born and raised, to be honest, but, but a hireling, and I, I don't want to get off on this too much, but a hireling is someone that does it for the money like higher critics. Higher critics do it for the money to destroy the Word of God or to cast doubt upon the Word of God. Um, and some of them are pretty good scholars. It's too bad they do not take their energies and prayerfully, because that's where it comes from, work for God rather than against Him. But they're hirelings. And they could care less about the flock. All they care about is the money. I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. That was one of the greatest shocks of my life when, before I began television teaching, men I probably thought I would never meet, never have the opportunity to even meet, that came to me wanting to know how I did it. <laughs> well, and it, of course, being raising money when I never talked about it. It's real simple. Let God handle it. Feed the sheep. They'll come to the trough. And, um, and that's all there is to it. When you feed them, but if you starve them to death by pinning them up by force, that is to say don'ts and do's and don'ts and chains, and force them to the trough, you're going to decline and never go a great, you're not going to do anything really a great deal. Or if you spend all of the expensive television time, and I'm sure making a lot of friends today, aren't I? If you spend all your television time raising money, as expensive as it is, well, you sure wasted a lot of God's money when you could have been teaching God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. I'm saying that God's blessings come from those that follow the path that Jesus cut for us. And Jesus very well tells you what a harling will do. Because I, I, think, I think I'm going to leave that there. We'll pick it up here because I want to say a few more words about the harling. Maybe, maybe I can say a good word about him before we leave this. I'd like to at least say a little something good about them. And maybe it'll come to me if I give it a day that I can think of something good about them. I'll try, all right? And we'll pick it up here in the next lecture. Hey, listen a moment, won't you please?